Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Jeff Moak. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today uh, during your lunch break. And I think we'll get started and as other people come online, uh, they can participate uh, as uh, they, they feel they can stay. The talk today is on the spectrum orthostatic intolerance to neurally mediated syncope. Uh, what I, I wanted to uh, outline at the beginning of our talk is uh, the spectrum of disorders from autonomic control uh, that are associated with orthostatic intolerance in children, uh, the disorders that happen in adults, uh, the neurodegenerative diseases are rarely seen in uh, children. We'll talk a little bit about some of the neurological associations a little bit later in the talk. Um, the most common thing that we usually see is what's called immediate orthostatic hypotension, and that's when uh, whoops, and that's when um, somebody stands up, and in the first 30 seconds of standing, there may be a drop in their blood pressure that's associated with dizziness, and then um, the blood pressure rapidly normalizes and their symptoms resolve. Uh, if the hypotension continues for a longer period of time, the, obviously the patient will stay or the person will stay uh, symptomatic and that's called orthostatic hypotension when it doesn't self-resolve. And then the most common thing that we generally see in children is uh, POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And then on the far end of that spectrum is normally mediated cardiac hypotension or syncope. So we'll begin our talk with uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Uh, the background for this is that POTS is a multi-system dysfunction disorder that primarily affects those organ systems with significant autonomic input. Organ systems affected include the central nervous system, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, cutaneous, and musculoskeletal systems. Patient symptoms may be limited to a single organ system, but more commonly a complex with a wide distribution throughout multiple body regions. POTS causes significant disability, limiting physical activity such as sports participation, and school attendance in adolescent patients. Or for the adult, uh, they may be unable to work a full day or, or ultimately the disability may cause them to be unemployed. POTS is a, not a very rare disease and is estimated to affect between 500,000 to a million Americans. So if you think that in the United States, roughly there are 300 million people, uh, that's one in 300 people who may have POTS. Uh, the age at presentation varies anywhere from uh, 14 to 45 years of age. Sometimes uh, in some families where there's familial disease, I've had evaluated some patients that are five and eight years of age where the mother's pretty astute and can pick up on early uh, signs of the autonomic dysautonomia in their child. For reasons that not totally understood, females predominate uh, with four to five females to every male that we might see. Uh, patients may present to the cardiologist, neurologist, or gastroenterologist, depending on the mode of the dominant uh, symptom complex and who uh, their uh, primary um, care doctor might be, who, who, or who uh, he or she might refer the patient to. While seemingly different because of primary mode of clinical presentation, these patients ultimately share many common features and overlap of symptoms. Um, POTS is actually probably not a, a new disease, but it was actually described in uh, during the Civil War as soldier's heart syndrome. There are some descriptions in the medical literature other people have called it the Grinch syndrome, chronic orthostatic intolerance, orthostatic tachycardia, 
sympathotonic orthostatic hypotension, uh, beta hypernergic, hyper beta adrenergic uh, state, idiopathic hypovolemia, mitral valve prolapse syndrome, neurocirculatory asthenia, uh, irritable heart, or effort syndrome. The usual presentation includes dizziness, lightheadedness, weakness, blurred vision, and fatigue upon standing. There may be orthostatic symptoms of palpitations, tremulousness, and anxiety, as well as gastrointestinal symptoms of nausea, abdominal cramps, early satiety, bloating, constipation, or diarrhea. Their, the patient or subject's uh, peripheral extremities usually appear cool and uh, slightly blue, cyanotic, with edema when they're upright. Uh, other manifestations include intractable headaches that are frequently medication-resistant, abnormal sleep, insomnia, and frequent awakening during sleep, mood disorders such as panic, anxiety, or depression, exercise intolerance, cognitive dysfunction, what we euphemistically call mental fog, uh, or attention deficit. Uh, syncope is relatively unusual, uh, but it can occur up to about 40% of the patients. The symptoms may appear abruptly after a viral infection, surgery, uh, vaccinations, or head trauma, such as a head concussion. Others experience a more insidious onset to the nature of their problem. The severity of symptoms can be quite variable, being very mild to profoundly incapacitating, such that we have um, many children who are unable to attend school on a regular basis and are therefore forced to be on home hospital study programs. Uh, symptoms may be worsened by menstrual cycle and relative dehydration. The course of the disorder may be self-limiting or follow a relapsing remitting course over several years. The majority of children actually improve by their young adult life. Uh, shown here is uh, a graph, not to uh, get too deep in the woods, but uh, there's a graph showing uh, the different symptoms and their frequency uh, that the patients uh, may have. This comes from a series of about um, 950 patients out of uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So they uh, estimated, sorry, somehow the mouse makes the screen advance, uh, estimated the incidence of different symptoms uh, on initial presentation as well as during subsequent visits. Uh, Dr. Anil Dabari, who works in the Department of Gastroenterology and myself, we've uh, studied uh, 103 patients uh, using uh, anodewadenal manometry in conjunction with uh, tilt table testing. And uh, the, shown here on the left are the nature of this, the frequency of the symptoms that these patients present. And since they were GI patients, their, their symptoms are obviously weighted to GI type symptoms. So they had nausea in like 83% of the patients, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, dizziness, presyncope, and syncope. And that's shown better here on, on this slide. Again, dizziness and nausea were almost equal in this patient population, 87 and 86 percent. Abdominal pain was very common. Uh, the presyncope and syncope was less common in diarrhea and constipation uh, with a lower frequency. The interesting thing is that 30 uh, percent, 29.1 percent of the patients had one or two symptoms. But 27% had three symptoms, and 20% had four symptoms, and 23% had more than four symptoms. So um, they tend to have a, a laundry list, if you will, of uh, symptoms. Uh, sleep disorders are, again, as I mentioned a slide earlier, associated with POTS. Um, there have been a few studies that have used uh, uh, polysonography and looking at heart rate variability during sleep. What, what's been shown is that the actual REM or dream sleep uh, frequency is re reduced. Um, most of the studies did not show major sleep pathologies. We've done at, uh, in our group of patients sleep studies in maybe about 20 
or so patients, and we've had some patients who have had uh, sleep apnea, uh, restless leg syndrome, and uh, two that actually have uh, narcolepsy. Um, and the subjective daytime sleepiness uh, seems to uh, be related to this heightened sympathetic tone that many of them exhibit. Uh, chronic pain also is common in the POTS population. Liz Bettini, who's one of the pain nurse practitioners, um, had looked at uh, 76 of the patients uh, we had with POTS and did tilt table studies over a 24-month period. 93% of the patients had pain as a symptom at diagnosis, and almost half of them had pain in one or more body regions. The most prevalent types of pain were headache, followed by abdominal pain, uh, musculoskeletal pain, and chest pain. Cognitive dysfunction is also common in this population. Uh, mental clouding, uh, or mental fog, as some might call it. Uh, this is a study from, uh, from uh, Vanderbilt that looked at uh, 28 female POTS patients. And they were able to show that they had impaired uh, memory, uh, impaired cognitive speed, and executive functioning. Now, what do we know about the possible etiology of POTS? Uh, we know that probably etiology is not one mechanism, but maybe heterogeneous, and different patients may have different mechanisms as their uh, cause of their symptoms. Uh, some mechanisms may be primary and others uh, secondary or uh, epiphenomenon. So one of the things that uh, makes good sense is that there may be uh, autonomic uh, denervation or autonomic uh, dysfunction or uh, neuropathic abnormalities. So in, some studies have looked at uh, lower extremity autonomic dener denervation as a a uh, possible mechanism for this. And the hints or clues to that are that uh, some of the patients, you know, have, lo have lower extremity anhydrosis, they don't sweat, uh, and using more sophisticated autonomic testing, their norepinephrine spillover uh, is impaired, so meaning that they have decreased epinephrine production in response to stimuli that should induce increase, an increase in the state of the norepinephrine. If one records selectively from perineal nerve, you'll find a decreased uh, sympathetic nerve activity in response to hypotensive stimuli that should increase the nerve trafficking. And I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. Um, they also tend to exhibit abnormal sweat testing if one does uh, pseudomotor axon reflex testing. Autonomic neuropathy is also known to occur after viral or or immune mechanisms, and some of the patients have been shown to have uh, ganglionic acetylcholine receptor antibodies, which is an antibody against the postganglionic acetylcholine nerve uh, or trans nerve transmitter. Um, this uh, is uh, again not to again get too deep in the woods, but sh showing an example of that denervation actually occurs in, in some of the patients. So what's uh, depicted here on uh, this uh, slide are, is uh, the upper and lower panel. The upper panel represents uh, N13 ammonia um, PET scanning, which is, represents the perfusion of the heart. And perfusion will happen as long as the coronary arteries are open and patent. On the bottom is uh, scanning done using a six uh, 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 fluorodopamine is a radioactive tracer that is taken up by the sympathetic nerves. So in normal subjects, you'll see uh, a good match between uh, perfusion as well as innervation of the heart. So in both cases, the two scans uh, are sort of superimposable. There's perfusion as well as uptake of the dopamine, fluorinated dopamine in the, in the nerves. In patients who have a pure autonomic failure, as well as some patients with Parkinson's disease, you'll see that they have normal perfusion of the heart as you would anticipate, but there's no uptake of the tracer by the nerves indicating that they have denervation of the heart. 
So in uh, children, as I mentioned at the beginning onset of the talk, that we don't usually see like pure autonomic failure, shy Drager syndrome, multi-system atrophy, but we do have uh, scenarios of autonomic dysfunction that would co occur in, with certain central nervous system uh, diseases, so such as uh, brain tumor patients, uh, patients with hydrocephalus, patients with uh, myelinopathies that can be uh, related to trauma or infection. Um, we uh, see some children who have insulin-dependent de diabetes. Diabetes is no known uh, with um, poor control and longer durations to induce uh, a neuropathy. Uh, we see uh, some patients who present uh, with acute uh, autonomic um, dysautonomias and uh, neuropathies. Uh, there are patients who, um, again, in cardiology, we sometimes see patients with Fabry's disease. Uh, Fabry's disease can cause a form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then, again, in the oncology population, we occasionally uh, are asked to evaluate patients who, uh, after chemotherapy, uh, one particular agent, being Kristen, it causes uh, neuropathic changes and probably autonomic dysfunction. And the most uh, prototypical uh, illness is really Sjogren's syndrome. Sjogren's syndrome, it has a very high frequency of association with, uh, with POTS. I have uh, one or two patients who have developed, initially presented with POTS, but then subsequently during the course of following them that they developed uh, lupus. Probably the most common mechanism is hypovolemia. And hypovolemia has been demonstrated using multiple techniques, such as showing reduced erythrocyte volume, excessive pooling of blood uh, with uh, uh, redistribution, essentially hypovolemia. This has been shown using uh, radioisotope labeled red cells and uh, seeing how much of the red cell counts uh, happen in, in, the, in the legs. Um, the etiology of the hypovolemia is uncertain. There may be impairment of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, so many patients with POTS have no, normal to or low uh, aldosterone levels. Uh, there may be renal denervation, and during chronic sympathetic activation, uh, there uh, the kidney uh, tends to uh, excrete uh, water. Um, abnormalities in the low extremity venous function. Many of you are probably aware when the patients stand up, you'll notice like bluish purple modeling of the low extremities. That's probably related to uh, uh, the venous pooling. Uh, the venous pooling uh, is most likely a manifestation of uh, decreased venous return. The decreased venous return elicits uh, a decrease in the stroke volume from the heart and then therefore a compensatory tachycardia in order to try and maintain the cardiac output. If one applies uh, like military anti-shock trousers, uh, one uh, can abort, oh, sorry, one can uh, abort uh, the uh, venous pooling and the orthostatic tachycardia. Uh, there are abnormalities in the baroreflex. Uh, as you know, in, in the junction of the base of the internal carotid, as it bifurcates, the, the carotid artery as it bifurcates into the external and internal carotid is a structure called the baroreflex, the bar baro-sensors. And um, there may be a primary abnormality in uh, its ability to uh, control and regulate heart rate and blood pressure. So despite an, in an increase, you have an increase in the heart rate without blood pressure, blood pressure changes that suggest this uh, dysregulation. Um, and many, when we do some autonomic testing, you see that the majority of kids we test with POTS, they'll have a, 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 their heart rate variability in response to the Valsalva maneuver is very uh, blunted. Um, increased sympathetic activity. Uh, people have measured our elevated arterial norepinephrine levels at rest. Uh, again, there's decreased norepinephrine clearance. 
um, POTS patients have an increased heart rate at rest, and I'll show you some data and a little bit about that. Uh, and then some of them have this beta adrenergic hypersensitivity such that for if one infuses isoportirin or a beta agonist in them, one has an exaggerated heart rate response compared to norms. One also records uh, the nerve trafficking in the perineal nerve. You'll see uh, uh, high amplitude sympathetic bursts uh, that are much more common uh, than in controls. There's a group uh, from uh, Dallas, uh, Texas, that's uh, studied some of the cardiac origins of um, POTS. One of their big contributions is they found that uh, the heart size may be uh, too small compared, uh, and that's re and coupled with uh, reduced blood volume. And I'll show you what that means here in a second. So here uh, is a slide uh, showing uh, some of their findings in the POTS patients and in the control patients. And this is a recording made from the perineal nerve in, ter uh, in terms of sympathetic nerve activity. And in the supine position, uh, you see occasional spikes from uh, nerve uh, trafficking. And then when the patient stands up, one would anticipate that the sympathetic tone would be turned on and there'd be an increase in the number of nerve uh, spikes, uh, but if it's, and the same thing happens in the control patients, but obviously during, uh, in this POTS group, one can see uh, more intense uh, nerve trafficking than in the control patients, and that's sort of seen here that uh, on average, the, uh, the, the median data, the average median uh, nerve activity is m much higher in, or a little bit higher in the POTS population than in the control population. And um, so this is a sort of summary data uh, that I wanted to highlight for you. So again, uh, the resting heart rate here in the POTS population was 88 compared to uh, the healthy control. So again, the average heart rate is faster in the POTS patients. And then, as as you know, I mean, we look for an increase, an exaggerated increase in the heart rate with standing, and that's what was seen here. So their average heart rate increase here was like 50 beats a minute. Um, and uh, what do I want to show you? So here, the blood volume they they uh, measured the blood volume. You can see the blood volume in the POTS population was 60 compared to 71 in the controls. And the LV mass, as measured by a cardiac MRI, was was significantly lower in the POTS population. If one uh, actually gets a chest X-ray on uh, POTS patients, you'll actually see the heart looks, tight, looks significantly smaller than you would in a what you would anticipate in a normal individual. And this may be hard to see, but I wanted to point out uh, a few things. One was here is the hemodynamic responses to graded upright tilt in the POTS population and in the healthy controls. And so the resting stroke volume, how much blood is being ejected per heartbeat in the POTS population is significantly lower, like 59 versus 86 in the control. So they have smaller stroke volumes. And that also transmits into that their cardiac output, how much blood is being ejected per minute, is also significantly lower, like here, five uh, liters per minute versus uh, 6.8. And to compensate this, to maintain their blood pressure, there is an uh, increase in the vascular resistance. So the peripheral vascular resistance in the POTS population is significantly higher, 1,300 versus 940 in the control. The Dallas group looked at the changes in blood volume with exercise. They are very strong advocates of exercise as a therapy for POTS. And so one sees here uh, three different states, POTS patients before they exercised, after they exercised, and then control pa patients. And you see the blood volume uh, did increase with exercise, but still it still was significantly lower than in the controls. 
Same thing for LV mass, exercise helped increase LV mass, but LV mass still was significantly smaller than in control patients. Uh, genetics plays a role. There's a very strong positive family history. In our own experience, I'd say the family history is positive in first and second degree relatives in at least 40% uh, of the patients. There's one known uh, genetic mutation, and that's in a norepinephrine transporter, as uh, shown here in this slide, described by the Vanderbilt group. Uh, norepinephrine uh, is important in the transsynaptic uh, um, membrane uh, coupling. And uh, after norepinephrine is released in the neuromuscular junction or neural neural junction, it's reuptake. There's a reuptake of it by these norepinephrine uh, transporters. And if there's an impaired norepinephrine transporter function, shown by this little X as a knockout, then the synaptic concentration of norepinephrine tends to be, will be higher, which may contribute to their increased sympathetic state. Other associations include chronic fatigue syndrome, mitral valve prolapse syndrome, mast cell activation, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and joint hypermobility. In evaluating patients with POTS, we also try to rule out secondary forms of POTS, that being like anemia, secondary to iron deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, patients been on prolonged bed rest, leading to deconditioning, side effects of medications, so vasodilators, diuretics, uh, patients been on a moderate uh, weight loss diet. Uh, we've seen patients who have endocrinologic abnormalities such as hypothyroidism, adrenal insufficiency, hypothyroidism, and hypoaldosteronism. As I mentioned, uh, diabetes can be associated with autonomic dysfunction, and there's association with Sogren syndrome and lupus. We look in the very refractory patients for patients with mitochondrial disease, which we probably see in about 5% of the population. Uh, diagnosis is based upon uh, tilt table testing. Uh, so we look for an exaggerated heart rate increase, usually without hypotension. Because um, many normal children can have uh, increases in their heart rate of up to 30, 35 beats per minute with standing, more recent criteria suggest that a heart rate increase of over 40 beats per minute used, be used as the threshold for diagnosis or and or persistent heart rate greater than 120 beats per minute. We also look for development of the typical clinical symptoms that the patient presents with and then resolution of their symptoms in tachycardia when they're placed supine. And here on the right is a little graphic showing what happens with heart rate and blood pressure in response to uh, tilt table testing in uh, the POTS population. Here in the very top part of the figure is the changes in the heart rate, and the bottom is uh, changes in the blood pressure. So throughout the, the tilting period, one sees a very stable uh, blood pressure in this subject, but there's a marked increase here uh, in the heart rate from, I guess in this patient, maybe like 90, 95 to 120 or so. What do we do to, for treatment? So we um, generally try non-pharmacologic treatment uh, as, uh, as a starter. Non-pharmacologic treatment may be as useful or more so than, than uh, medication. So the things that we try are avoid exacerbating factors such as uh, vasodilating or sympathomimetic drugs, dehydration, those uh, patients who have significant uh, inf uh, have significant menstrual cycle influences on their symptoms. We try and modify the menstrual periods with long-acting birth control pills. We, we teach and suggest that the, instead of getting up quickly, that they arise slowly and in stages um, and uh, avoid prolonged uh, standing and walking in hot weather, avoid high environmental temperatures, and avoid uh, eating large meals. 
lower extremity support stockings can be health, helpful, uh, having the patient sleep for prolonged periods of time, and prolonged being uh, day, weeks to months with the head of the bed raised may help uh, their, uh, re or orient their nervous system to allowing better uh, adaptation to upright position. And uh, we uh, encourage exercise, aerobic exercise with lower extremity uh, muscle strengthening. Uh, sleep hygiene is important. Uh, so we, uh, if they have trouble initiating sleep, we'll try them on melatonin. Uh, if this doesn't help, we might uh, do a sleep study, if, particularly if there's a history of snoring, uh, suggestive of obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, and those who fall asleep and then can't stay asleep, we may try clonidine to help them stay asleep. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for pain and symptom management is very important. Um, POTS is, uh, is, not, is, a, is a true familial disease. It's not just a teenager's problem. The whole family uh, is involved in the disorder. And so cognitive behavioral therapy, incorporating the parents, uh, can help them alert, uh, learn, just learn some of their behaviors that continue to reinforce, uh, like pain behaviors. We try and resume academic activity, having the kid go back to school. Um, this can't usually happen overnight, but there's a gradual and incremental attempt to increase the class load that the the, this, the adolescent is uh, uh, undertaking. Uh, identification and treatment of comorbid uh, psychiatric illness, depression, and anxiety disorders are common in this population. Uh, training in relaxation strategies is a core element in, the, in pain management programs. And that's uh, shown here on this slide is very small group, one of our uh, electrophysiology nurse practitioners, uh, Robin Fabian and Vicki Friedenberg embarked upon using uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction. They had a very small group of like six subjects, so obviously a very small sample size. Uh, and so uh, these subjects underwent uh, a 10-week program of uh, in-person uh, training and meditation, yoga, uh, sorry yoga, um, group discussions about stressors, and uh, four of the six who were not in school were able to return back to school at least part-time. 90% uh, felt better that they, after meeting other POTS patients that helped them learn uh, strategies to deal uh, with their illness, and they didn't feel alone anymore, that you know, they're the only ones with this problem. Now, in those that despite uh, non-pharmacologic treatment is still symptomatic, we may try increasing their plasma volume as, as to start with. So we usually have them have high fluid intake, drinking like 80 to 100 ounces of fluid a day if they can, depending on the, their size, and try and avoid the caffeine. Uh, high salt diet or salt supplementation. Uh, if that's unsuccessful, then we'll try them on fluoronef, uh, fludrocortisone usually 0.1 to 0 .0 0.1 to 0 0.2 milligrams a day. Uh, we monitor for uh, development of edema, hypertension, hypokalemia, mood changes, and on rare occasions, we've seen some develop hirsutism. We encourage a high potassium diet to prevent some of the hypokalemia that happens on the higher doses of fluoronef. And we have them monitor their blood pressure to avoid uh, fluoronef-induced hypertension. Uh, acute ingestion of 16 ounces of cold water in, in the morning may be helpful. Uh, it has the presser effect uh, that can help them uh, not be so dizzy in the morning. And those, again, who are uh, refractory, we may use uh, intravenous fluids. Uh, if that's not successful, then we may try alpha adrenergic uh, therapy using midodrine, uh, pseudoephedrine, Methylphenidate, we use both for its vasoconstrictor effect as well as its effect on their cognition. Uh, we may use uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, uh, mestinon, uh, pyridostigmine, and some uh, studies suggest beta blockers can be helpful. 
a uh, lower dose is better than a higher dose. Though beta blockers is kind of mixed, I'd say at least 25% of the patients actually are worsened uh, being on beta blockers. Uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors can be effective. Uh, we've sometimes used on occasion. Uh, sorry, why the mouse is doing this? Uh, DDAVP uh, uh, and uh, if you if a few patients, we have about 10 patients we've probably treated with octreotide, again with another uh, vasoconstrictor. Now we'll just uh, switch gears to uh, neurally mediated cardiac hypotension syncope. Um, the definition of syncope is the transient loss of consciousness and postural tone. Obviously, if the loss of consciousness is not so transient and goes on and on and on, the event then might become a sudden cardiac arrest. I saw earlier in the year Dr. Uh, Arashe uh, gave a talk about syncope. Uh, so neurally mediated syncope uh, may be a reflex mechanism uh, related to uh, increases in intrathoracic pressure, so this cough and sneeze, valsalva induced. We do see uh, some children who have post micturition syncope, uh, post defecation syncope. We have some patients, that, uh, one particular patient has a, a, what's called deglutition induced syncope, which causes paroxysmal AV block, uh, airway stimulation, diving reflex and obviously vasodilator drugs uh, such as uh, isoproteinol, sympatholytic agents, or nitroglycerin uh, can induce hypotension and syncope. The, what, this is a, a graph showing uh, the input uh, to the brain, uh, cerebral cortex, um, uh, midbrain that may uh, be triggered by any of these uh, factors on the left side here, cough, uh, stimulation of the carotid sinus area, uh, airway stimulation, swallowing syncope, GI stimulation through uh, uh, post like postprandial syncope, and then GU uh, stimulation through like micturition. Uh, so the, these, thing, these uh, stimuli get transmitted uh, to the brainstem through the ninth and 10th uh, cranial nerves, and uh, then uh, elicit uh, a, a negative feedback uh, through the carotid baroreceptors and mechanical receptors, such that parasympathetic tone is increased, and therefore the heart rate slows, and there may be AV block, uh, and sympathetic tones inhibited that leads to vasodilation. So in some patients, they'll have combinations of this, both bradycardia and hypotension. Again, uh, there are different uh, tilt protocols that are used. Uh, that people use different uh, degrees of the angle of the tilt, like 60 degrees, 70 degrees, uh, standing is 90 degrees. Uh, the duration of the tilt and, the t and the, whether the patient has an IV, uh, arterial line, these things influence the yield, whether the test is positive or negative. Some uh, centers will do pharmacologic provocation with isoproteinol, adenosine, nitroglycerin, or esmolol withdrawal. Here, uh, we don't uh, do or usually do pharmacologic uh, provocation. We usually tilt the patients at 70 degrees for uh, 45 minutes without IVs or arterial lines. Um, here is a, a nice example of a response of the heart rate in the dotted line and blood pressure in response to uh, tilting. Uh, one sees a drop both in the heart rate and blood pressure in this particular subject. One looks carefully, usually the blood pressure actually drops before the heart rate. And this uh, gets into uh, the classification of uh, neural like syncopal responses in res to uh, head up tilt testing. So the most common is a type one response where you see uh, both a drop in the blood pressure and the heart rate. The, again, the blood pressure decline happens prior to the heart rate. Heart rate usually doesn't get too slow, doesn't fall below 40 beats per minute. Type two is a cardio inhibitory form where the heart rate decreases below 40 beats per minute 
or the patient develops asystole. And then vaso and type 3 is a more a vasodepressor response where it's mostly the blood pressure that declines with minimal change in the heart rate. And this, this is important because it uh, factors into uh, how one might consider treating the patient. Uh, so here uh, is, a, uh, again, a more hemodynamic and uh, micro, neuro, micro recordings from nerves during a tilt table testing uh, in the control group and the syncope group. And you see changes in heart rate, uh, central venous pressure, systolic, diastolic blood pressure. And here they did a, a staged uh, tilt. They went 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, 70 five degrees, and the bottom part of the figure represents changes in sympathetic nerve activity. So in the control group, one can see, uh, you know, an increase in the heart rate. Blood pressure, for the most part, stays pretty stable, but one sees uh, a marked increase in sympathetic nerve activity. In the control population, one sees an initial spike in the nerve activity, but then nerve activity seems to uh, decline around the time that the blood pressure decreases. Um, this is ind maybe indirectly related to changes in norepinephrine and epinephrine. Norepinephrine is a vasoconstrictor, and one sees, uh, again, these are controls, and then this is the um, syncope patients. One will see an increase in norepinephrine in both populations, but the increase in the control population is a little bit more vigorous than what one sees in the syncope patients. But the other element of this is epinephrine, which is a vasodilator, uh, uh, actually increases more in the syncope patients. So you have a combination of less increase in the vasoconstrictor part of the nervous system and a greater increase in the vasodilator part of the nervous system that probably leads to a decrease in the systemic vascular resistance. But this is a, uh, a slide from a study we did uh, many, many years ago looking at heart rate variability changes during um, tilt table testing. And we divided the uh, study into early, mid, and late parts of the, late part being syncope of the study. And this frequent, the, the uh, heart rate variability or power in this part of the curve represents sympathetic activity. This represents parasympathetic activity. So early in tilt, one sees, sorry, one sees a, a marked increase in sympathetic activity that is gradually withdrawn during uh, the mid tilt, and then during syncope, there's almost there's almost very little, is less than in the supine position of sympathetic activity, and a marked increase in the parasympathetic activity. We repeated the study after we gave the patient a, sal a liter of normal saline, and one sees like the, that the syncopal response was aborted, and one sees a relatively constant pattern of uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic activity. A study from um, Mayo Clinic uh, used uh, isoproteranol as a mechanism to induce syncope, and with gradually increasing doses, they eventually uh, caused the syncope to happen, and when here they were they used uh, measures of cardiac output uh, using like thermal dilution catheters. They were able to calculate what the drop in the peripheral resistance. So that uh, brings us to uh, this kind of our, uh, the framework of how we tend to think of syncope happening: that there's a decrease in the venous return to the heart that leads to a decrease in the left ventricular volume that activates uh, bar uh, the baroreceptor as well as a mechanical receptors uh, in the heart. Uh, the drop in the volume initially leads to an increase in sympathetic activity, increase in heart rate and inotropic state to the heart. Uh, eventually, the decreased volume in the heart uh, leads to uh, this concept of an empty ventricle that causes stimulation of the basogyrish uh, reflex which are mechanical receptors in the wall, left ventricle, that then lead to a decrease in sympathetic tone, increase in vagal tone, leading to bradycardia, vasodilation, and subsequently syncope. Now, this is a, an interesting response 
we sometimes see, here's a patient and doing a chill table test who uh, slumped over. But at the time of this, his heart rate and blood pressure were normal. So we call this pseudosyncope. Uh, but it's not clear uh, always if this is really true uh, in the sense that there, there are uh, there's a, a study from a uh, patient with so-called pseudosyncope who had isolated vasoconstriction with normal heart rate and blood pressure. So here are, are uh, several different states. Uh, supine, if the patient's tilted for two minutes, and then after upright for three minutes when the patient became syncopal. Again, one can see no, the heart rate and blood pressure don't change, but there are uh, changes in the um, post-fertility index in the cerebral, middle cerebral artery, you see less, less pulsatility suggestive of vasoconstriction. Uh, and so um, many times some patients are easily treated, but majority of patients despite treatment continue to have events. And people have tried to look and wonder about this question, are treatments for vasovagal syncope really effective? And in meta-analysis studies, um, there is evidence that some therapies can actually improve. M many therapies that we tend to use when really put to the test in large numbers of patients don't really uh, show a statistical improvement. So one of the things that have been found effective are serotonin uptake blockers. And that's, uh, I'm going to skip over a few because I want to leave a few minutes for questions. So here is a study uh, looking at uh, the use of fluoxetine versus placebo and the number of syncopal episodes, the cumulative proportion without syncope. So the control of placebo population continued having syncope, whereas those with fluoxetine uh, had, uh, still had some syncope, but significantly less. So I wanted to end over here and thank you for uh, sharing your lunch hour with me and uh, open it up for uh, any questions. Anybody uh, have any uh, questions, things they wanted to uh, Ask. Hopefully, I can hear. Um, if um, you uh, obviously in the future, if you uh, care to uh, refer a patient or you have a question, uh, and I think this uh, presentation will be available uh, to you, uh, that you can obviously contact me through the cardiology number. Or here is my email address. Well, thank you again uh, for uh, participating in this webinar, and uh, uh, hope to talk to you sometime in the future. Have a good rest of the afternoon. Bye, everybody.